Here we go. Again, welcome. I am so pleased to introduce our program this evening with Nancy Harmon Jenkins. Camden native Nancy Harmon Jenkins learned to read some years ago at the Camden Public Library. From there, she went on to a career as a nationally known food writer and a culinary historian with eight cookbooks to her credit, plus thousands of, public, of articles in publications from the New York Times to Savoir to Smithsonian. Most recently, she has published a long report on aquaculture in Maine for Maine boats, homes, and harbors. And after talking to her for a bit in preparation for this program, she's just an all around really cool lady. So I'm looking forward to this very much this evening. And without further ado, let me go ahead and turn this program over to Nancy. So Nancy, you can go ahead and unmute yourself and we can get this show on the road. Just hit play from the start. Okay. And left all right. All right, perfect. Now. There we are. Uh, this all took place in the evening of April 1st in the year 1807 when a woman in the Kennebec Valley sat down as usual to write in her diary. And as usual, she mentioned the weather. And that's what's circled there. You can read it along with me. She wrote, snows and blows, but we are able to make a fire and have food to eat, which is a great mercy for which I, for which I wish to thank the great donor. So who was this woman and why should we care? This woman was Martha Ballard, a Maine housewife, a nurse, midwife, cook, baker, brewer, gardener, hostess, weaver, the mother of nine children, six of whom survived to adulthood, and a trenchant observer of the small but rapidly growing community on the banks of the Kennebec River in what are now Augusta and Hollowell more than 200 years ago. Her family, herself, her husband Ephraim, and their five surviving children moved to this river settlement from Oxford, Massachusetts in 1777 in the full throes of the revolution, although the fighting, uh, the fighting was pretty much far away to the south. Martha was also a prodigious diarist, and I believe not a single day went by that she didn't write something from January 1st, 1785, when she began her daily record, and she was already 50 years old, until almost the day she died in May 1812, 27 years of her accounts. Meticulously, she chronicled the events in a bustling riverside community of farmers, loggers, entrepreneurs, settlers, explorers, merchants, ministers, doctors, and their womenfolk and their offspring. The diary, The diary is a prized possession of the Maine State Library, and it is a fascinating resource for historians or for anyone who's curious about the past. You can read and explore the diary online at this website with uh, related documents, and you can see not only the original diary as Martha herself wrote it, but also the transcription. And moreover, you can search the entire diary for anything that interests you, from midwifery to pigs to scarlet fever, which Martha called canker rash, and which was a scourge of the community for a number of years. Martha's diary was not always recognized as a prize, however. This is not the place to discuss the history of the diary, but suffice to say that for nearly 200 years, it was buried in the state archives, and male historians dismissed it as trivial in its concerns and of minimal interest. There were no generals in it. There were no battles. Uh, there's nothing that, that uh, those male historians were interested in. It's women's stuff. And that's also because, as you saw, Martha's handwriting was pretty challenging, although she was fully literate. Um, but transcribing her words and then unraveling them and tracing the events and the personalities and the relationships in this frontier community was a task for a determined historian. And fortunately, one came along, Laurel Thatcher Ulrich. Uh, you, we just saw, here's her book again, this great book that she wrote and for which she won a Pulitzer Prize. And later she got a MacArthur Genius Grant for all, her overall work on women's history. She's really a great cool historian. She, uh, when she wrote this book, she was in the history department at the University of New Hampshire and she's now at Harvard. As a food historian, I looked to the diary. I look, first looked at this book and then I fell on the diary itself. And I looked at the diary for hard and fast information about what was going on in Martha's kitchen and her gardens. 
And frankly, it's not always easy to find. I would uh, submit that for Ulrich, food was not a primary concern. She was much more interested in the midwifery, as that's why she calls it a midwife's tale. Um, and um, so it wasn't something that you could just go to the index and look it up. You had to really burrow through this book and then through the diary itself. It took digging and rooting around and then putting the information together with a few other sources the kind of sources that are available to develop a picture of how our main ancestors lived and especially what they cooked and ate and shared with their neighbors and families. This is as close as we can get to what Maine kitchens were like in 1820 when Maine became a state. And the surprising conclusion I reached, it's not all that different from the way Mainers ate in my own childhood here on the coast, and it's very different actually from the way we live and eat today. Cookbooks are an obvious source for what people ate in the past, but that comes with a caution because the views they offer are by their very nature quite limited. That is, cookbooks tell us what the author hopes we will eat and cook, but they don't tell us what people actually were eating, what women, well, women are the primary audience for all cookbooks everywhere, what women actually were cooking. And they were also written for an elite, and Martha was not part of that. She only once mentions a book, let alone a cookbook, apart from the Bible. But she was literate, despite the fact she didn't seem to read very much. Um, and she does write in her diary about what she cooks and serves her family and guests, the food she grows in her gardens, the animals they kept, pigs, a couple of cows, chickens, some sheep, probably a few ducks because occasionally she, she cooks duck, and also the food that they buy or barter for with neighbors and in the local stores. In researching what Americans ate, how they sourced it and what they did with it in the early years of the Republic, these rare diaries like Martha's can add a lot to what we find in cookbooks. At the same time, personal documents like these give us insight into women's lives at a time in our history when really from girlhood on, the primary obligation of women of almost every social class except the most elevated was to guarantee the food supply of families and communities. Martha arrived in Hollowell, as I said, in 1777 to join her husband Ephraim and Ephraim had moved to the district two years earlier. The ballads were part of a broad movement out of the older, more settled, more settled uh, communities in Massachusetts. They were looking for land and perhaps a new start. After his wife and five children joined him, Ephraim settled his family along the banks of a swift running brook that still empties into the Kennebec River in a part of Hollowell that's now Augusta. Bowman's Brook, it's now called Bonds Brook. Um, there he rented land with a mill where he ground grain and ripped timber. He was an accomplished miller. He had been milling in Massachusetts, so he knew what he was doing. Um, this is a surviving mill building in Lebanon, Maine, down in the very southern part of Maine, close to the New Hampshire border. It was built in 1774 and it was not, has not operated as a mill for many years. I think it's now a private residence. But Ephraim's mill on Bond, Book, Bond Brook essentially wasn't very different from this one. You can kind of see the shadow of the mill wheel on the masonry there. Um, hasn't had a mill wheel in a long time, but that was how it functioned originally. Martha raised their children, um, and the youngest one was Ephraim Jr., who was actually born in Hollowell in 1779. She planted her gardens. She gathered herbs like saffron and uh, sage and mallow and feverfew and sumac. This is the sumac we see growing all over Maine, which she used in her nursing practice, and of course she composed her diary. Along with all her other chores, she worked as a midwife, assisting in local births, of which there were many. In the spring of 1791, the Ballads moved a short distance downriver, and later they went to live on land that was part of their son Jonathan's farm, but essentially, they were residents of this growing river community throughout the 27 years of the diary. Maine then was still a backwater of Massachusetts. 
when the Ballards came to live there, and Hollowell was still a frontier village of log houses, although it was beginning to be well settled. There was a meeting house at that time. There were several stores. There were wharves because the river was a major thoroughfare for transporting lumber, barrel staves, grain, and other goods down to Bath. And by 1700, there were 100 families living on both banks of the river right here in this uh, place that became Hollowell and Augusta. Of course, there were, there were larger communities down river and Bath was a growing um, mini city at that point. Um, and on the left bank, the east bank of the river, was Fort Western. This is what it looks like today, which uh, had been built in 1754 at the height of the French and Indian Wars. But by the time Martha arrived, it had been de decommissioned completely. And it was a private home of a powerful family, the Howards. Actually, it was, there were two Howard families living in this. You can kind of tell it's a huge structure. Um, they kept a store at the fort and they sold all manner of goods, including um, yard goods. These are yard goods over here in the back. Here are the yard goods. And they sold housewares like tea kettles and, uh, and china plates. At one point, um, uh, Martha mentions in her diary that Ephraim picked up a pewter tea kettle at the store. It's not clear that he got it at the Howard store, but that's the kind of goods that they were selling. And foodstuffs too, including molasses and rum. Uh, it was very popular. Now, I would urge you all to do what I did a couple of weeks ago, and you'll have to wait until spring when it opens up again, and go over to Augusta and pay a visit to Fort Weston. I'm embarrassed to say that I've lived in Maine all these years, and I had never, ever bothered to go over there. It's fascinating. It's beautifully curated. It's full of information about, about early Maine history, and it is well worth a trip, and not just a trip you know, to entertain your 10-year-olds your on a Saturday, but really you'll get a lot out of it too. Now, Ephraim Ballard was not alone in seeking out cheap land and abundant resources in the main back country. By 1790, according to the census, the population of Maine had increased by 40,000 over the previous decade. That perhaps doesn't sound like an awful lot, whoops, sorry. Um, it has a way, it has a mind of its own, this computer. Um, but it had increased by 40,000 over the previous decade. Now that um, may not seem like a lot to us right now when we talk about 40,000 people, but in terms of, um, of the late 18th century, that was an enormous increase. And moreover, between the revolution, uh, the end of the revolution and 1820, when Maine became a state, 200 new towns were established. And one of them, of course, was Camden and Rockport, which was settled and incorporated officially as a town in 1791, about the same time that Martha and Ephraim were over there settling on the Kennebec. So the years covered by Martha's diary were extraordinarily busy and productive for Martha herself, as much as for the growing community that she served. Along with all the births and deaths that she assisted and recorded in her diary, she also paid discreet attention to local scandals, like noting the male parentage of illegitimate babies, which was something that midwives were required to do. As soon as the woman had given birth, the midwife said, and who is the father? And the, um, the woman, if she knew, uh, had to say. And in one case, it turned out to be Martha's son, Jonathan. Uh, and that was swiftly followed by a marriage with Sally, the lady who had given birth. And they stayed married for a very long time. It wasn't just, it was a shotgun affair, but it was a lasting shotgun affair. Um, so she also noted various crimes and misdeeds that took place. There weren't a lot of them, but there was a rape of a minister's wife that was quite shocking. And there was a terrible murder when a whole family was murdered by the father of the family and only one child escaped. She noted arrivals and departures from as far afield as Boston and New York, but events of the greater world beyond the Kennebec very rarely intrude in the pages of her diary. And even so, you have to read between the lines. Only then do we understand that when she writes about her husband's surveying team, beset by, uh, in, in the woods by a gang of strangers disguised as Indians, and beaten and robbed of valuable compasses and surveying equipment, this refers to an ongoing struggle between, on the one hand, the so-called great proprietors who uh, who 
owned and, and uh, controlled vast stretches of mainlands, and on the other, um, the squatters and settlers who were attempting to lay claim to territory and who felt that after the revolution, these great proprietors, many of whom were Tories, should have been deprived of their lands and it should have been given over to the people who, um, who had to settle there, who needed the land. Now, um, this struggle, Ephraim Ballard uh, enters into this because he was a surveyor. And as a surveyor, uh, he was employed by agents of the proprietors to go out and measure the land and figure out how to get people to pay either rent or uh, pay for a quick claim deed or somehow um, uh, somehow uh, uh, somehow um, accede to the uh, power of the great proprietors. Now this uh, struggle went on for decades but it has been described in this magnificent study, Alan Taylor's Liberty Men and Great Proprietors. I recommend it highly to anyone interested in the period. Our own General Knox figures very largely in this story, as some of you probably know. But when you look at Martha's di diary for food or cooking information, you also have to read between the lines. There's not a recipe to be found nor any instructions that give a hint about how she or any other woman prepared the cornmeal and flour that were ground in Ephraim's mill, the fruits and vegetables that came from her garden and her orchards, the veal calves and swine and chickens that are slaughtered on a regular basis. She notes what she planted and when she harvested, she notes days of brewing, beer and baking bread, of churning butter and making cheese, and when guests arrive for tea or coffee or chocolate, for roast chickens of what, or what she calls a line of veal. This work was not incidental to her midwifery, which was an important source of cash and barter income. But the real work of Martha Ballard and women like her throughout North America was providing sustenance for their families at a time when outside sources of provisions were very hard to come by. In winter, this is not the Kennebec, this is actually Norton's Pond, but it's illustrative of what, I, what I'm trying to say. In winter, uh, when the ground in Maine was frozen iron hard and the ice clogged river was no longer a trade route, you, could, you took your life in your hands if you crossed the river in the winter time because you never knew when you might um, encounter a, a patch of weak ice and just go right through it and that was the end of you. Um, and Hollowell had to be self-sustaining and individual families had to be self-sustaining too. And most of that sustaining was the result of women's work. It's hard to put a monetary value on that until we remember that without it, families might very well have starved. The economy of these frontier communities was complex. Subsistence farming and gardening supplied most of the Ballard family's needs. At the same time, cash money came from export crops, wood products from ships' timbers to barrel staves, or cornmeal and wheat flour from the grist mill. And an assortment of these small scale skills and crafts brought in extra cash or commodities, midwifery and weaving in Martha's case, and surveying in her husband's. It was an intricate bartering system that governed the exchange of goods and services among neighbors. And I think this is one reason why she began the diary. It was a way of keeping track. She notes persist persistently who she has paid, who owes her, how much of their debt they've paid off. They gave me this worth three shillings and they still owe me 10 shillings, that kind of, of thing. It was a very accurate way uh, of, of measuring what was going on in the community. She was sometimes paid uh, for her assistance at a birth or an illness. She was sometimes paid in money, but often in foodstuffs, sometimes as common as a, a pair of pumpkins or a barrel of rye flour, but sometimes exotic or difficult to obtain goods, things like rice or a packet of India tea or um, chocolate or a brace of pigeons, or a bottle of brandy or rum. Once, as a special present for a special service, she knows that she was given an orange. And I long to know, she never says what she thought about that orange, but I long to know what it was, what she thought when she started to peel it back. And you know how that, that perfume of the orange can, can just invade any space that you're in. Here she is in this rather um, dusty, crowded main kitchen, and she starts to peel the orange. What did she think when she smelled and then tasted that exotic flavor? She doesn't tell us, I'm sorry to say. The surrounding territory 
was acres and acres of virgin forest. And lumber from mills like Ephraim's was an important commodity, not just for construction, but uh, for shipbuilding, which would very soon become a major industry on the main coast. And the reason for that was this, this immen immense forest that once existed here, still exists in a little bit of, a, of an area. And so it was, uh, shipbuilding was part of it, but there also was exports to the Caribbean of lumber were very important, uh, especially barrel staves to um, make rum barrels and sugar barrels. It was part of the unfortunate triangular trade that involved slavery very deeply, but um, it happened. Um, cordwood was shipped out to fuel city fireplaces. Tan bark was very important for the leather industry, and wood ash went to make potash or pearl ash for various uses, including soap making, and a more recent discovery as a leavening for cakes and quick breads. And I want to come back to that in a few minutes because it's an important, uh, it's a, an important piece of this whole question of what they were cooking and why and how. So it was an economy in which women played an equal role if officially subservient to men. And like the other women in her community, Martha kept poultry for meat, eggs, and feathers. She milked and pastured cows. She made butter and cheese for the family larder and for sale. She maintained extensive vegetable and herb gardens. And then she pickled, salted, and dried the produce, including pork, for the family larder. But they were not entirely self-sufficient, and both cash and barter went into purchases of, for instance, coffee and tea, molasses, pepper and salt, garden seed, tobacco, snuff, which really surprised me, snuff for Martha, that is, sugar and fish. They had access uh, up the river to, uh, that is coming up the river to fresh and salt cod from the coast, smelts in their season, smoked herring, and salmon and sturgeon directly from the river. Martha talks about buying commodities, and this is, uh, this is puzzling to me. She buys commodities like flour, apples, potatoes, wheat, and corn, despite the fact that these were all produced by her own family or by her neighbors. And she frequently mentions making cheese, but almost as frequently she speaks of buying it at one of the stores in the community. So whatever they were doing, they were not doing sufficient to supply themselves. They had to go out and, and, uh, and access it in other places. So what did she do with all of this? To get a sense of that, we have to take a look at what Martha's kitchen was like. And first of all, and most notably, she had no stove. All of her cooking was done with live fire on the hearth or in the oven, which was probably built um, like this one at our, this is from our own Conway house here in Camden and Rockport. The oven was built right into the side of the hearth. This is the, the oven here. And it was, um, it, it got, it had its own separate fire. It's not that it was built in there in order to get heat from the fire in the fireplace. It had its own fire, but the chimney, uh, it was a kind of a joint chimney that um, that operated for both of these. Um, at Fort Western, now this is another bake oven, and I, I hope you can see this. It's kind of dim, but in here, the oven has been stocked with wood for the next, uh, next baking, ready to fire. Uh, a wise housewife at the end of baking would make sure she loaded the dying oven with wood that would slowly dry out, and so it would be ready to just fire up when it was next needed. Even the humblest European American homes had a hearth of some sort. They, they would not have been considered homes if they hadn't had a hearth, but not every home had a bake oven. And many of Martha's neighbors, she mentions Mrs. Forbes, Mrs. Savage, Mrs. Williams, Mrs. Bowes, many of them baked in her oven from time to time, and they exchanged the use of the oven for other goods and services. And then Martha herself earned cash money one summer when she baked for a neighbor who was on his own without his family. So she writes frequently, the girls baked and brewed. And from this, we understand the yeasty connection between baking bread and brewing beer, or rather between brewing beer and baking bread, since similar yeasts were used for both. Some cooks might rely on a type of sourdough for leavening, keeping back part of the dough from each baking to start off the next batch. But wherever beer was produced, barm, which was the, um, the frothy residue that's kicked up when brewing, barm was also used to raise bread. What we don't know is whether the girls were making cornbread or wheaten bread 
or most likely the mixture that thrifty New England housewives called thirded bread. It was one third cor cornmeal, one third wheat flour, and one third rye. I'm guessing that Martha's baking schedule was not too different from those of my own neighbors in Italy, where the oven is fired up every, every week or 10 days. And the first to go in when the oven is white hot inside are breads and pies. And then as the oven temperature starts to fall, it's used for um, roasting meat, those chickens that she often mentions serving, or baked lamb or pork. I haven't found a mention of baked beans. I, I searched diligently for it, hoping for it. I couldn't find it. But the dying heat of the oven was probably used for drying things like slices of squash and apples to preserve them. And then at the very last, in goes the wood for the next baking. Now, one of the things that's not always um, clear for people who haven't done much of this wood-fired oven baking, that fire is lit and it burns and sometimes more wood is added to it until the interior of the oven is white hot. And then the ashes are raked out and the whatever is put in there, uh, roasts or bakes or whatever, in the heat that's accumulated in the oven. It's not that, you, that the uh, food is cooked by the fire, it's cooked almost like a convection oven by the, the heat that surrounds it. Now, if this all sounds tedious and complicated to a modern cook, and it does, it was at least only a weekly task and not a daily one. But daily, Martha had to, had to deal with cooking on the hearth. Um, this is one of the hearths at Fort Weston, and I wanted to show you this because it's a good lineup of a few of the kitchen uh, tools she might have used. The crane from which the pots hang, and uh, they can hang at different levels depending on, uh, on how hot or how cool you want them to be. And then the crane itself can be moved um, from side to side depending on the heat. Um, the little black sauce pot, can you see that here on its tiny little legs? It's an adorable piece. And that sits above the embers and or, you know whatever is in it, maybe you're melting butter or lard or maybe you're, um, uh, maybe you're baking beans in there, who knows? Uh, and then one of the most important oven tools is this tin roasting oven, which was an 18th century invention, and it's sometimes called a roasting kitchen. And you put your meat on a spit in there. Uh, here's a, not a very good illustration, but I think it gives you more of a sense of what that looked like. You put your meat on this spit, and you uh, arrange the, uh, the oven so that it faces the fire. So the fire is reflected back from the back, the tin back of this onto the meat. The, the, uh, the meat is surrounded by hot heat. You have a handle on the side for turning the spit. And then in the back, you have this door that opens up so that the cook can go in and see how the meat is doing and baste it if necessary. And then the juices all collect under here. And in some of these, there's actually a spigot on one side so that you can drain the juices out very easily. It's, a, it's an ingenious sort of thing and it became very, very popular. So did Martha's hearth look like this? Hmm, probably not. Uh, it was probably a good deal messier looking. But, uh, but you know, it probably, it, in essence, it was very much this sort of thing. Um, I mentioned earlier the usefulness of cookbooks in understanding what people eat and how they cook. Martha Ballard, as far as we know, never had access to, or even knew, of a little book of recipes and household hints that was published in Hartford, Connecticut first in 1796. It was called, you can see the title here, American Cookery by Amelia Simmons. And it was apparently the first American cookbook. There had been other cookbooks here that were imported from England or reprinted here from British cookbooks, but this was the first American cookbook that we know of. A modest attempt to define for the first time ever the content of a new, thoroughly American take on the domestic arts. Now, if you think about um, countries these days, when they become independent, they have to have a national airline. Back in those days, when countries became independent, they had to have a national cookbook. And that's what this is in a brand new country with a brand new sense of national identity, patriotic pride that at times bordered on the most outrageous kind of jingoism. It was natural that a national cuisine like American music and American speech 
should become a part of this evolving national culture. The book was a huge success. Two editions were published in 1796. A revised edition came out in 1800 and successive editions were published in the years that followed. This one, which is being held by my friend Don Lindgren, is uh, it's an 1831 edition published in Vermont. And I want to thank Don. He has an outfit in Biddeford called Rabelais Books. And if you're interested in any kind of culinary history or antique books, uh, antique books dealing with food and wine, he is the place to go. And he provided me with these photos for which I'm very grateful. He's a, he's a great main resource, in fact. So what makes this book unmistakably American is actually the presence of products that were also part of Martha's kitchen and garden, but they were still unknown in most of Europe. Products such as corn for one, um, that's bloody butcher corn. And I have no idea whether Martha raised bloody butcher corn, but she certainly raised a lot of corn, but also pumpkins, squash, potatoes, and cranberries. It's true that wheat, the favorite English, which was really the favorite English bread grain, it was grown throughout the colonies, but here in the Northeast already, yields were starting to go down and pests and diseases were always a problem. Uh, the ballad still grew wheat and also purchased it. And Martha often baked wheat and bread, but corn is much more prominent in the diaries, both as a crop and as a pantry staple. But what did she do with that corn and cornmeal? It was so essential to her. Was it an ingredient in the brown bread that she baked so often according to the diaries? Lots of brown bread recipes called for that mixture of corn, rye, and wheat. Did she maybe also make Indian pudding? Amelia Simmons has three different recipes for Indian pudding, including a very rich one mixed with eggs and raisins and butter and sugar. Johnny cake, that archetypal American cornbread, there's not a mention of it anywhere. Uh, but she does make uh, corn pudding and she makes a hasty pudding once when she felt unwell. She said, I felt unwell, so I made myself a hasty pudding. Um, not a baking day went by without pies being put in the oven, along with usual apple and mince, and also berry char tarts and cherry tarts. Pumpkin pies, though, were favorites in the household, and they may have been eaten as they, not just pumpkin pies, but all pies. Uh, when I was a child in Maine, in, in old-fashioned homes, they very often were eaten for breakfast along with a piece of cheese. Um, it was it, and you think about it, it's just as healthy and perhaps more so than um, uh, those um, those kind of frozen things that you get in the supermarket and drop in your freeze in your toaster and then slather on butter and jam. Uh, why not pumpkin pie for breakfast? It sounds good to me. Uh, in American cookery, Miss Simmons's pumpkin recipes are called puddings, but they are baked in a crust and they're very familiar too. The combination of pureed pumpkin with cream, eggs, molasses, allspice, and ginger, as she writes about it, it continues to grace our Thanksgiving tables to this day. Many of the staple vegetables and fruits that are mentioned in American cookery would have been as familiar to any continental European cook of the day as they are to modern Americans. And at one time or another, Martha grew most of them, including peas, green beans, lots of different beans to shell and dry, broad beans, today we call them fava beans, carrots and parsnips, potatoes, onions, beets, cucumbers, lettuces and cabbages, radishes, muskmelons, currants, pears and apples, but she also grew peppers, uh, possibly only for medicinal use. She says they're an antidote to colic. And garlic, whether for cooking or medicine, we're not sure. Miss Simmons disdains garlic as not being suitable for uh, 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 the right kind of table. Um, she mentions, this is uh, Martha mentions, not Miss Simmons, Martha mentions plums, quinces, gooseberries, damsons, and cherries, whether her own or sometimes from the orchards of her neighbors. And rhubarb, another familiar fruit that grows well in this northern climate, though it too was more for medicine than for cooking. Because she was a midwife, 
uh, she also served as something of a paramedic. And so she grew a great variety of medicinal herbs, some of which she may also have used in her cooking. She planted coriander, which we now call cilantro, and anise, mustard, something she called peppergrass, I'm not sure what that is, and chamomile. And surprisingly, she writes of harvesting saffron or providing saffron as a medicine. Now, I've talked about beer barn for leavening for bread, but by the time Amelia Simmons's cookbook was published, another type of leavening was coming into general use, and it was one that would revolutionize cookery in America as well as in Europe. And that was pearl ash, a refined pot ash that lightened doughs and batters and produced a faster rise. American Cookery is the first cookbook we know of that mentions pearl ash, and this is the precursor of our modern baking powders. So it was very important, a very important um, introduction into cookery. What was pearl ash? It's a form of potassium carbonate that's obtained by leaching wood ashes, and they had plenty of wood ashes back in the day. And it was a valuable commodity with many uses, two that Martha would have been familiar with, uh, and she couldn't have done it without them, were soap making uh, and bleaching finished cloth. She made soap periodically, just as a matter of course, she mentions it in the diary. And as a weaver, she whitened her fabric by soaking it in a potash solution. I cannot confirm that she used it in baking too. It's the kind of detail that she never ever gives us. But the mention of pearl ash in Simmons's cookbook means it was already a familiar American ingredient and quite possibly it was in Martha Ballard's kitchen as well. Martha was almost single-handedly responsible for her vegetable gardens, a responsibility that seems only to have increased as she grew older. Her daughters grew up, married, and left home, and so she was alone there. And it was Martha who cleared the ground in spring, Martha who pulled the winter banking away from the warm east side of the house to prepare the soil for the first little seeds to go in. Um, there's Martha working in her kitchen, in her garden, I mean. Uh, that's at Fort Western, and it isn't really Martha. We don't have any photographs of Martha, but um, that's what she might have looked like out there working in her garden. It was Martha who planted potatoes, sowed seed, transplanted cabbage stumps. Those were plants that had been wintered over in the cellar and set out in early spring, and they would, they would sprout, and they would provide fresh greens, and eventually they'd go to seed, and there would be seed for the next year's crop. It was Martha who saved seed and even sold seed to uh, many of her neighbors. Uh, it was Martha who was responsible, of course, for the harvest and for putting it by, for pickling it, salting it, drying it, to provide for those long months of winter. She even speaks, she was very thrifty, she even speaks of making vinegar from pumpkin parings. Day by day, in the month of May, 1809, here's what Martha did in her garden. Set turnips and cabbage stumps, planted cucumbers and three kinds of squash. Again, planted squash and cucumbers prepared a bed and planted more squash seeds. Again, planted squash, also cucumbers, muskmelons, and watermelons. Planted long squash, dug holes and planted three quince trees. Planted two more quince trees and an apple tree. Planted potatoes, set out lettuce plants and strawberries. Sowed what she calls string peas. Planted cranberry brown and 100 to one beans. Those are the beans that you would dry and keep for the winter set out, that is transplanted squash plants, again set out squash plants and cucumbers. Mr. Ballard helped with the digging and set the poles for Martha's hot plants, but Martha did everything else. And while doing so in that month of May, she also tended a sick neighbor, delivered four babies, including one of her own granddaughters, brewed ale, baked bread, boiled soap, ironed, and did the normal run of housework. That year, she was 74 years old. Laurel Ulrich in her book calls attention to what she, I'm quoting her now, the intricate horticulture that belonged to women, the intense labor of cultivation and preservation that allowed one season to stretch almost to another. That's the end of her quote. In this day and age, when we have abandoned so many of the skills of our past, it's good to remember the importance of gardening, especially in women's lives and in reckoning women's sense of their own worth as providers rather than mere consumers. Not only do we not cook much anymore, we no longer know much of anything about growing our own food. Put to the test, many of us would just fail. <laughs> 
and yet the good food that we know was so prevalent in Maine until perhaps the middle of the 20th century was the product of more than just skilled hands in the kitchen. It was the outcome of patience, care, and attention paid in the garden too. Martha's skill and diligence in the garden and in the kitchen meant that the ballads were never without food on the table. We don't have many details of what that food was. The diary lacks even the kind of notes about seasoning or cooking time that can help a skilled cook reconstruct a recipe. Despite many notations about cooking and sharing food, about extra miles at the table, about guests who came for a meal or to spend a few days, we don't even know if Martha was a good cook. His friends and family looked forward to uh, a stuffed pig or a brined leg of pork like these, full of sweet herbs, butter, and eggs, described by, uh, this is uh, two pages from Amelia Simmons' book. Um, Alas, we'll never know because she provides us with so few references or suggestions of flavoring, let alone a recipe. Just once she gives a hint. In May 1786, she writes, we dined on a fine leg of corned pork, that is brine pork, stuffed with green herbs from our garden. Now that sounds quite fine. Yet it's impossible to read her diaries without a sense of the overwhelming importance of women's role as providers of food, not just in frontier villages, but throughout this young republic. I still have so many questions after studying this diary and, and other documents over the years. And one of the, the most pressing for me, and I want to mention it now, has been the absence of any reference whatsoever to Native people. We know there were groups, sometimes large groups, of Wabadaki throughout Maine, but especially, and especially in these important river valleys. And yet, in all the years of the diary, there are just three references to Indians. So where were they? I have my theories, but that would take me probably another three days to, uh, to disclose, to embroider on. But briefly, before closing, I do want to talk about Thanksgiving since it's coming up very soon because the surprising thing to me in these diaries was the recognition of Thanksgiving, which I learned in school at least, was set by Abraham Lincoln at the end of the Civil War and confirmed by Roosevelt in the 1930s. But here are the ballads, along with their friends and neighbors, noting the holiday, always on a Thursday at the end of November or the very beginning of December, and very often celebrating it with feasting. Christmas, on the other hand, is mentioned just five times in the 27 years of the diary. Thanksgiving was almost always marked by a public service, which Martha sometimes attended and sometimes she didn't and often by feasting, by extra guests for a meal. At one, there were 15 people around the table, and a menu that was often over the top. In 1803, when Thanksgiving fell on December 1st, they dined on a roast goose, boiled beef, pork, and fowls. At other times, she just says, today is our Thanksgiving, but always it was commemorated in some fashion. As for the pumpkin pies, they were there for sure, as they will be perhaps at your own feasts. And I want to wish you all a happy holiday. And remember, please, despite everything that has happened, despite this terrible year that we've been through, what we still have for which to be thankful. Butterball turkeys, canned uh, pumpkin pie filling, to the contrary, notwithstanding. Let's remember that, as Martha said, though it may snow and blow, we are still able to make a fire and have food to eat. And if we can't all be together the way we were last year or the year before that, we can still be grateful for the chance to Zoom from one house to the next as we wish each other a happy Thanksgiving. Thank you all very much. If you have any questions, I mean, I'm happy to answer questions now. If you think of something later, there's a way to get in touch with me, okay? Thank you so much, Nancy. And we are so grateful that you, this is so perfectly timed as we discussed earlier. Yeah. <laughs> People really start thinking about food in November. And of course, um, I, I do want to recognize one of the people here in the audience this evening is actually the person who prepared a lot of that food that was featured in those photographs oh. from Fort Western, Susan Reedy. Um, she's an excellent 18th century cook. Um, so thank you for her beautiful handiwork. Um, Nancy, that was wonderful. We'd ha we have had some questions come in already, so I'm going to go ahead and get started with those. Donna okay. asks, uh, what did they use to keep pies and breads from spoiling or molding? Um, and she wants to know about refrigeration in summertime. 
uh, they had no refrigeration at all. They probably, they may very well have, she never mentions this, but they may have had a well. They may have, those of you who have uh, moved to Maine and bought a very old house may have been surprised to see that at certain times of the year, there's a stream running through the basement. That was deliberate because it kept the basement cool. Uh, but as far as refrigeration is concerned, of course, there was nothing at all. Uh, she doesn't mention ice, so I don't think there was even the custom of, uh, of carving up ice and uh, using it in the home. Um, but uh, they didn't worry that much about preservation because they ate it all. You know, they ate the pies up, they ate the bread up, and what they did preserve, they salted or dried or pickled. And that was the way. I think that this is um, one of the things that uh, makes the diet probably... Uh, very stodgy in the winter time is that prevalence of of salt and vinegar and um, no fresh greens or or you know we can go out at any time and even buy fresh greens raised in Maine in a greenhouse in the winter time, but uh, they didn't have that luxury, so they made yeah it was ult ultimately just super seasonal eating. I mean, yeah. what was there, what was available, um, and you had mentioned, of course, that you know that Martha Ballard and, and many of the people who were living in the area at the time utilized the store that the Howards ran. Um, right. And I wanted to uh, to mention that one of the wonderful and unique things about the um, Fort Western is they actually have the original account books from the store. So, um, you know, for folks who go and visit there, you can look at copies of this, of course. They don't have the originals on display, but you can read through precisely what was carried for foodstuffs and other things in the store. And it's, it's fascinating to see what was popular. Um, you know, I, I remember things from it from the list like sugar and molasses and salt and chocolate, which of course was you know the the unsweetened chocolate. Um, rum, and, don't forget rum. Oh, chocolate. lots of rum. Yes, <laughs> one of the top ten things sold. Um, and but occasionally, so you see things like spices and dried peas and and dried um, like green coffee beans, things like that. Uh, but then you see the more exotic things come in, like lemons once in a while. And how exciting that must have been when those things came. Yeah. Um, just you know, I guess the same way we all get excited when pomegranates start showing up in the grocery store now. <laughs> Um, we have had so many comments coming in, so many people thanking you and saying what a great program this has been. Wonderful program, um, very well done. Thank you, very interesting. Um, yes, so much, let me scroll back down. Okay, someone else is asking, what were the flatbreads in the picture at the beginning of the presentation? And I think Susan uh, has mentioned that. She said the flatbreads were actually crumpets. Um, okay. I was wondering that too. <laughs> so uh, another person mentions, um, I think when we were talking about food preservation, um, this person says they also larded. Can you tell us what the word larded means? Larded? Larded. That, that's know? like a, um, uh, oh, it's an old French technique. Um, it's a confit. Uh, you would preserve meat, especially in lard, not fresh meat, but you would, uh, I mean, first of all, you would preserve salted meat in lard because lard kept the meat from drying out, of course. But also there were ways, and I don't think that, um, I don't think that uh, Martha Ballard was into this kind of cookery, but certainly French housewives, and probably in Quebec, there were French housewives mm. who, were, uh, who were making a confit of very often of something like duck, some very fatty meat or pork, and uh, cooking it down in a way that, um, it, it, it becomes bathed in lard, and of course, it's it's completely sealed off from any air when mm -hmm. the lard is around it. And uh, uh, cassoulet, for instance, that famous French south southern French dish, it is required to have um, uh, to have a confit of pork or duck in it. So it was a very typical thing. But I don't think that anybody in this um, very Anglo community was doing that sort of thing. Um, we have a question from Noel. It says, does she mention foraging for wild foods or hunting? I don't see any references in the book to hunting, although they do mention occasionally that uh, someone brings them a piece of venison or wild meat of that sort. But I don't think that uh, it, it doesn't appear to be that anybody in the family hunted. There's no reason why they wouldn't have, but um, 
uh, perhaps I simply were such hard workers I didn't have time to go hunting. Uh, she probably foraged for greens as most people did here when I was a kid, especially dandelion greens. Um, but she doesn't talk about it. You know, she doesn't say I went out in the woods and found, and certainly not mushrooms. You never see mushrooms mentioned in these early cookbooks. Okay, we have, um, uh, I'm not sure if I'm reading this correctly, but Denise asks, was soma sea used as a seasoning? I'm not sure what soma. Uh, sumac, sumac, sumac. Oh, sumac, okay. Yeah, it was yeah. Okay. Uh, yes, it definitely was, but it, more importantly, it was used to make a, a, a drink. Um, it's sometimes called um, farmer's lemonade or because it's very sour, it's full of antioxidants and it's very good for you. So I suspect that it was used more in that sense. This is where in the old British cookbooks, you often find it referred to as a, um, and I think Martha was using it primarily as a medicine and not in her cooking at all. Mm. Because when she mentions it, it's, it's in reference to a specific disease or a fever or something. So it's full of, of vitamin C, among other things. And it seems, you know, just based on my experience in reading through um, 18th century cooking, they seem to have a taste for, uh, for you know, like vinegars and, and those sort of uh, flavors anyhow. So I'm not surprised to hear the sumac with that vitamin C or that, you yeah. know, acidic flavor was, was popular. Um, do you have a rec Matt asks, do you have a recommendation of a recipe from the, um, the, cook the American Cookery Cookbook that is accessible to today's home cook? Wow, you know, uh, <laughs> it's hard to say. It's not an easy book for anyone to read. I've got a modern version of it right here. And this, I think, was published by... Um, uh, Dover, you know, that the, they do all those sort of reprints of things. There are lots of, of uh, recipes in here, but are you going to want to cook, um, oh, I don't know, there's a lemon pudding. I'm just opening it random. Uh, she's got these Indian pudding recipes. Um, you have to know what you're doing when you're using, using a, a cookbook like this because the language is so very different. But there's a lot that's been written about this and a lot of people have made the attempt to translate these recipes into something that's accessible to modern, modern cooks and modern kitchens. To boil cabbage, uh, what does she say here? This is one of these things. She doesn't tell you. Sometimes she will tell you to boil something for 40 minutes. And you know that, I mean, to boil French beans for 40 minutes. No, you don't want to do that. <laughs> Even to be authentic to the 18th century, you don't want to do that. Well, with the authentic 18th century, you have the interesting spelling. And of course, a handful of this and a handful of that. Well, right. everyone's handfuls are different sizes. And very often an ingredient just gets left out entirely. The assumption being that, of course, you would know that it belongs in there. Well, we have a lot more questions in just a little bit of time. So I'm gonna go through them pretty quickly, a few of them. Um, can you talk a little more about saffron? Saffron comes from a type of flower. Can we actually produce saffron here in Maine? Yeah, you can, it's a crocus. And crocuses grow very well in Maine. And it, the problem is you need probably an acre of crocuses to get uh, enough saffron to um, flavor your risotto if that's what you wanna flavor with it. Um, it's, it's laborious. Um, but she does mention it. She mentions growing it and she mentions using it. And it's always, again, as a medicine. It's never a flavor in her cooking. Well, who knows? Maybe she did flavor, but she doesn't say that she did. Mm. Uh, Dawn writes that perhaps peppergrass is cress. So that's interesting. It could, that could well be. Okay. That's a very, uh, very astute um, idea. Yeah, I think that's very, uh, very oh. interesting. Um, we have a comment that sumac is used by teas uh, by native Abenaki as well. That's, yes, uh, it is indeed. No, um, the origin of pink lemonade came from the use of sumac. Oh, that's an interesting comment. Oh. Um, and saffron has a uh, Elizabeth writes saffron has a long history of being grown in England. Saffron Walden is one of right. the, the places, for example. Uh, yeah. That incorporated the word into their name. So I assume that anything that would grow there would grow in Maine. That's right. Pretty, we have a similar climate. That is true. Um, I'm just scrolling through. We have so many questions and so many comments. A lot of, a lot of folks saying how great this was. 
Um, let's see if we can wrap it up. Oh, I think that was just about it. Okay, perfect. Well, there we go. <laughs> there we are. <laughs> At seven o'clock on the button. How perfect. <laughs> um, Nancy, this has been such a joy. And, you know, again, I, I love 18th century cooking. So I was very much looking forward to this talk. And you did clearly so much research um, in putting this together. And just, I'm super grateful that you agreed to do this talk for us. And um, thank you. I, I highly recommend folks to check out some of Nancy's cookbooks. Um, you know, if you enjoyed her perspective on this, then uh, you should hear what she has to say about olives. <laughs> exactly, yeah. Not what has to do with Maine in the 18th century. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. So as I mentioned at the beginning of the program, folks, you are all always welcome to join us at Camden Public Library programs. They are free and open to everyone, and you can find out more about them at librarycamden.org. I'll be posting a recording of this program on the Camden Public Library Program's YouTube channel. Uh, with that, I wish every good a good evening. And Nancy, once again, thank you. Thank you. It was my pleasure. All right. Take care, everyone. See you next time. Bye-bye.